All right, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you could lead us quickly, briefly, succinctly through what you have for us this morning, not rushing, but taking it in, making sure that we're standing on the firm foundation of the word of God, that we keep our compassion and our love and our balance according to that word, even as you give us revelation. Guide us and keep us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And so, I will not review in depth last week. Uh, what I did do was expose uh, some of the spiritual roots of, of what is going on in the Mideast. It's not new. It goes back 3,000 years. We discussed it. First exposed with Esau. Secondly, through Genesis 10. Coming back again through Scripture over and over and over. And exposing in the spirit of, of that root that even goes to Lot and it goes to Noah's son, etc. We could see it passing on. And uh, that is, as we discussed, identified in what we refer to as the Old Testament or the books of the Law and the Prophets is the different uh, Amalekites, the Amorites, the Ammonites, and the Begbites, right? So, hello. Hello, hello, okay, I just had to throw it in to see if y'all are listening. All right, wake up. Well, the bed bites, we know how to get rid of, but the Amalekites, the Amorites, and the Ammonites, it's a little difficult. And we can literally chase, trace the, uh, th this, these, the people, the descendants, into different uh, places and countries today, even though it's a little bit somewhat disjointed. For example, the Ammonites are, you know, the capital of Ammon of Jordan, and, and the Ammonites are there. The Amalekites are up just north of, of uh, Gaza, Gaza, and uh, the Philistines are, that's the, 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 the name for the Philistines that has been transformed now is the, the Palestines, the Palestinians. They come from that area of Gaza. Gaza was Gaza a couple thousand years ago. It was larger. Gaza is Gaza now. Gaza also is involved in the area of Judea and Samaria. And so we understand that the Lord says that as he brings forth his people and saves Israel, he will first deal with Judah. And then he will deal with the rest of Israel. And so we begin to see prophetically, but according to the word of God, some things happening. Let us not be too arrogant to think that we understand it all and we connect all the dots. There are some out there, I encourage you, if you like to listen to them, do. There's information there, but there's also some bones you need to spit out. Uh, there are people who, you know, they put a timeline on God, they put a timeline on, on the end times, they've given it seven years, three and a half years, the beginning of seven, the mid of seven, the end of seven, and consequences that aren't necessarily truth. One thing we do know, only Father God knows the time that the Lord is returning. And, uh, and, and I think when he says the time, I think that he means what he says. And so, but we do know that we are the season, we're in it, we see those prophetic bells chiming and ringing that awaken us and alarm us to watch. We're in a season of watching and we are the people that God has called from forth from the beginning of time to be those who help prepare the way for the second coming of our Lord. For some, it will be the knowledge of the first coming of the Lord, right? I was once in, in Israel with Teddy Colick, the famous mayor who was given years that he was able to hold together both uh, Arabs, Palestinians, and Jews in Jerusalem. He was very successful at it, and once sitting in, an, in, in a conclave of, of uh, 5,000 Christians in the Benyanea Uma, uh, Teddy said right there with the backdrop of Jerusalem, he said, the one thing we agree to in our Judeo-Christian faith together is that we know that the solution to the Mideast, to Israel, is the Messiah. And he said, and we know that he's coming to Jerusalem. And when he does, then some of us will ask him, is this your first or your second time? We understand that the solution for what's going on is not going to come through any nation. It's not going to come certainly through the United Nations, which I think is so ineffective it ought to go away. 
I applaud what Reagan did back in the day. He quit funding them, but unfortunately, right after him, they released all the money back to him, and all they do is use it as a platform against the United States and Israel and Christianity. I mean, that's the bottom line. And uh, you have little voices making big decisions with our money. With our money. Um, don't get me going on that, but I haven't been in favor of the UN for years. It doesn't really serve anything but those who want to serve themselves in any regard. You know, and then you get somebody who's, you know, comes from a small country and all of a sudden he's the president of the UN. Really? Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. So I'll leave that one aside. Let me keep going. That's the political scientist in me gets angry. But on this instance, we understand that there's certainly something serious has occurred. And that occurred three Saturdays ago. And we were anticipating something in this house for a couple of months. We knew we were crossing a threshold. We knew we were getting at it. We had no idea what that threshold was, and it's always easier to look back and understand, but we have crossed the threshold. And now we have seen that the antennas of the world are up all over, whether pro, con, or confused, or chaotic about what has happened and what's going to happen next. There will be more crossings, but this one is pretty, pretty epic. It has started something that's not going to stop. This is not the one where the nations of the world are going to come down against Jerusalem and then the Lord's going to come and do battle in the final days as it speaks of. I don't believe this is that one. But this is a foreshadow of that one and how fast it can slip and how fast it can go and how even a, an army as strong as Israel can be caught asleep uh, because of complacency and because of distractions. And so that's the same message to the body of Christ. We can be caught asleep because of complacency and distractions. For me, I internalize it. The Lord says, watch, for you know not at what hour I'm coming. And, and when I do come, I'm going to catch many who are not ready. And not being ready when the Lord says it is not a good thing. It's not just a physical punishment. It's a spiritual punishment. So complacency is one of the major enemies of our faith, is complacency. Another one is, is doing nothing when we can do something. That's omission. And omission is, is not a good thing. When we're called to do something in the time that we're called to do it, we can say yes, we can say no. I found it very interesting that, that I, I, I read a lot about what's going on. I like to stay involved with it, and I like to be able to, to somehow understand it according to word of God in today's timing. And something just came out in the last two days about a, a, a professor from Stanford who has spent years under, uh, studying the free will, years understanding the free will. And his conclusions were, didn't make sense. His conclusions were that basically the free will, without me giving it to you, all of you, the free will can, can be conformed, which somewhat I understand, but that at the end of the day, nobody really has free will. That's, that was his conclusion. Well, God help him. God help him. Um, we have free will, and God created us with free will because he wants people that want to love him, that want to serve him. He wants us to come to him. He gives us every opportunity. He gave us his own son. He gives us grace. He gives us the word of God. He conforms all things to work to our good when we believe in love in him. He has tried to do everything he can for us and continues to do it with his hands opened up, but at the when it's all said and done, we have free will. We say yes or no. We say yes or no to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord or Jesus Christ isn't Lord. We say yes or no, is the word infallible? Can you believe it? Is it real? Or is it something that's a storybook and has been truncated by the flesh and hand fingers of, of mankind? We have those choices. For me, for me, I've made my decision, Jesus is Lord. Number two, the word of God is the lamp unto my feet. And without it, I stumble and don't know where I'm going, and it's a firm foundation. But then he also does something called calling us. Those who are predestined are called. And if you're called, then you can become what? Sanctified. But you have to answer the call. And you have to say, Lord, here I am. And then he sanctifies us. He calls us forth in that sanctification and sets us aside to do something in the kingdom of God. 
And there are some who are called into salvation, but they're stuck there, and the only benefit is to themselves. And there are others who are called into salvation and redemption, and they realize the call is to be able to invite others in, to go after others, to find them, to seek them. And we go back to that same law from the beginning of creation, every kind brings forth its own kind. So the whole reason that Jesus Christ came was to bring back the Father, his family. That's an E.W. Kenyon book, The Father and His Family, and to deliver the family back to the Father, both past, present, and future, because he's timeless. He's timeless. So when we understand that, we begin to look through a different lens, and that lens says to us what really is going on. And then we see chaos break out because people are uninformed, and there are people that don't know God, and there are people that hate God. We need to understand there are people alive today who not only profess that they hate God, they act hating God. And scriptures are very clear about that. And some of the reason that judgment comes down upon certain areas and certain people is, number one, because the sin of the land has to be repented for, but number two, because they hate God. And God doesn't take it out on somebody that just hates them overnight. He's very patient. In fact, he can wait centuries and even a thousand or two years. But the Lord does respond with those who hate God. They are literally enemies of God and children of a different type of God. And when somebody succumbs to being the children of a different kind of God, they can do some really horrible, terrible things to humanity and humankind in the name of anything else. And beloved, I think I've said it to you again, but I'm going to say it over and over, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe some of you online, is that I do not believe in ecumenical faith. I believe that that's from the pit of hell. I believe that if we're called together to pray with people that are praying to Buddha and to Allah and to different gods, that we are, in essence, causing an idolatry act before God. We are not to hold hands in union with somebody who doesn't believe in the living God. And I came under a lot of problems with that earlier on in my walk when I was called to go to all kind of places. And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, you will not worship in a mosque. You will not get down on your knees in a mosque. And so I had to leave that mosque, even though I was trying to show love and brotherhood. And he said, and you will not pray but in my name. And, and then I realized, who's more important to me? Who do I fear more? And it was, I fear God more. And so I tell you right now, even though it sounds good and kumbaya, and when there's problems, you know, faith leaders get together, but some people are leading into the wrong faith. And uh, that, you know, you can have, atheists have faith, by the way. Atheists have faith. In fact, that's a tough faith to have. To say that you don't believe in God, that, that's, that's a really, really rock-hard faith, isn't it? It takes a lot to come to a position that you don't believe in God because there's so many reasons to believe in God. One is you get up and breathe in the morning. Two is that you, you can function. Three is that he tells us that the, the, that the stars themselves, the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything declares the glory of God. So in that instance, our eyes are open and we begin to understand what is the, 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 what is the consequence of what we've just experienced. And I entitled this last week, and I'm going to build on it, is where is the God of Elijah in all of this? Where is the God of Elijah in all of us? And what we dealt with, we, we talked about what happened when, when uh, Elisha was there anticipating and asking for the promise of uh, Elijah, and, he was, and Elijah said, if you're with me and you see me when I transition, when I cross over, from this to heaven, then you may have what you've asked for, which was difficult. He wanted a double portion of what Elijah had. Well, first of all, even asking for a portion of what Elijah had is, is a big stretch. So you could see that there must have been something inside of Elisha, but we hear of no miracles he did until he crossed over. But there was a difference. He went from a point where he was watching and where he had a knowledge of God and miracles, when he crossed over, he had the anointing and he had the relationship with the God of Elijah. 
And then in that relationship, he was able to operate in his calling and destiny. I believe that's the opportunity for the believers and the, and the body of Christ and for leadership right now, is crossing over, not just having the knowledge of God, not just even having the knowledge of, 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 of the level that we were at, but like Elisha, when we crack the mantle down and we say, where is the God of Elijah? Then we enter into an even deeper, broader, thicker, more important, potent relationship with the God of Elijah, the God of Frank, the God of you. You know, if we ever get satisfied in our relationship, we, we, we become fearfully dangerous. We come to the point where we think we're fine, untouchable, and there's nothing else that we need to do, and we get so drunk on grace that we realize that that, that that grace could be a dam that could break and let judgment come through. And the Lord, he, t he talks to us about that. He warns us. He says that judgment shall begin in the house of God. Why would he even have to tell us that? Why would, why would we even have to think about judgment beginning in the house of God? Because the Lord knows that there's complacency and problems and just because we have a title or call ourselves something or we're in a place or we've served something so long that we become complacent and comfortable, he says judgment must begin in the house of God. Why? Because to whom much is given, much is required. And that's why I believe leadership, men and women of God, need to walk in a fearful relationship with the Lord God Almighty because we're given much. Believers are given much. I, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I've been given a whole lot uh, of abundance and love and knowledge and revelation and power and gifts and, 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 and confidence and faith in the Lord God Almighty. He's poured out more grace on me than anyone should ever have deserved in their life. I've received that, but it also, thank God, he's, he's instilled deep in my spirit the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is that to whom much is given, much is required. And whereas somebody else might get away with something for a while, I don't think I could get away with it overnight. I think the Lord would either take me or slap me or do something to me because I could become dangerous. And that's what happens. People lead people the wrong places. The blind end up leading the blind. And gifts do not define somebody. Gifts do not define somebody. What defines somebody is the personal relationship where is the God of Elijah? Where is he with you? Where is he with me? Who is he to you? Who is he to me? Now, I think the Lord's dealing with that too right now, isn't he? He's not just the God who prospers us. That's a wonderful thing. That's a great message. He's the God who heals us. That's an even better message as far as I'm concerned. He's the God who delivers us. That's a tremendous message as far as it's concerned. He's the God who, who puts us on our feet and puts us in our place and gives us another chance. He's the God of another chance. That's tremendous. He's the God of always hope. That's always good. But is he, is he fresh to us in our relationship with him? And how fresh is he? What are we taking from the threshold we have just crossed? What did the world take from the last big threshold we announced, but we didn't call it a threshold we called it a, a pause in the earth. We called it an amazing thing was about to happen, and it was COVID, and the whole earth came to a pause. But what lasted out of that? Churches got emptied a lot because people were afraid to go, and guess what? They never filled back up. They never filled back up. Because out of it, instead of the fear of the Lord and a hunger and thirst for God, came a complacency. I could just stay home and, you know, plug it in, and I can get up and run to my refrigerator and, you know, maybe turn on a football game or a soccer game in another country at the same time or put on the news and flip back to the channel and catch something at church. And, and, and by the way, I don't have to tithe because I'm here. I don't have to do that either. And so that complacency goes away. And ah, worship, you know, worship is worship. I could plug it in. I'm not going to get involved with the service during the worship. I'm only going to get to the message. And boy, I hope he doesn't go too long. And Yeah, complacency complacency. Huh, I'm hitting some buttons, aren't I? Aren't I? Hitting some buttons. We forget that we need the fellowship. We need the relationship. 
We need each other. I'll tell you, there's not a day I don't come into the sanctuary I don't thank God for you. Every day. And I know I have friends and people in other places I could dial them up, but they don't, they don't mean the same to me as you, and I'm being honest. Yes, some who can't be here geographically, I love them. They're brothers, they're sisters. And I try to speak to them as often as I can. But it's the relationship, it's the fellowship. It's because I know you at the level that I know you, and I hope you know me. And it doesn't mean that, that we're intimate at all times, but it means we know that we know. And that's the relationship we need with him. We need a relationship where we know him at all times. And that we understand that he is his love and, and, and his love and his sovereignty over us is impeccable. It's impeachable. You can't touch it. And that there's dark, dark times on the earth. A lot are saying they're coming. They're here. You know, why should we have to vote to save babies? Why should we have to vote to, to kick drugs out of our children? Why should we have to overturn school boards to quit teaching our children garbage? Why should we have a government that can't even govern itself right now? Why should we be served by, by government officials who are incapable of serving themselves? It's a dark, dark world. It's a dark, dark world. We don't, we don't even know who's pushing the buttons in our world anymore, do you? I don't. I hear all the conspiracy theories. I don't want to believe any of them, but then I say maybe I should believe all of them because I don't know what's going on. But I know what's behind it. I know what's behind it. It's, 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 the, it's the climatic good versus evil, God versus Antichrist. And so as we discussed, modern day Palestine is a fruit of a 3,000 year old Philistines. Now it doesn't mean everybody in there has bought into it, but, but you know what? God holds us accountable for what we allow and what we also don't don't end up removing ourselves from, doesn't he? We can say, well, I, I don't have a choice. You know, I, I, my, my child has to be with that teacher because that's, that's my child's teacher. No, you can pull that child out. You can turn stuff off and turn stuff on in your lives. We have choices to make. And those choices aren't governed by other people or other things unless we allow them, correct? So we walk in that balance and we try to understand that balance. The one thing I was talking about as we were coming out of the point of going through the biblical uh, roots, and by the way, I could recommend some, some books to you, uh, at least two men that wrote that came out of Islamic Jihad. In fact, the one was a son of the Sheik, who was one of the founders of the PLO. What a tremendous book as he found Christ and was able to reveal so much, both, both politically, militaristically, and spiritually, and he got it. He understood that, 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 that the roots were the problem. And, and, I, and before I get away from that, I, I wanna say this to you too. I know that, that the government of Israel is, is, is hell-bent on destroying Hamas, and I think I shared with you they can destroy their infrastructure, they can chase down their soldiers, but they're not gonna destroy Hamas because it's a spirit. And that same spirit has a name called Hezbollah, and then it has a name called Iran, and it has many names, and it's an age, age old spirit. And according to my book, when Babylon falls, there's only one other spirit in the, in the universe that's gonna deal with that, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so, we need to understand that literally this, this war is against flesh, but we're not warring against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. And these are some of the strongest principalities that have ever, ever walked the earth. How many of you know that, that it, it, I just wanted to give you this a little bit of historical fact. How many of you know that the Iman, the Iman of the Mideast sat down in the inner circle with Hitler in the discussion, and not only the discussion, but the implementation of the final solution to kill Jews. How many of you know that? Yeah, I know you know it. 
That's a fact. So when you begin to understand that their charter says kill Jews, Hitler wasn't the first one. But the militant Muslims grabbed onto it, killed Jews. And, and some of my family has been so upset. Me too. You know, I see, see Jews going into the Capitol building, which is strange because not that I was in favor of January 6th, but it's the same thing. I didn't see them getting arrested, and I didn't see them getting pulled out. They should have been. They, they came in and they interrupted a congressional vote for the speaker. They sat and did things. They didn't bust up the building, but I don't know. Why not? Where's the law? I look for equity in the law. And, and in that instance, they presented themselves as Jews who are railing against Israel and declaring that the whole reason for Hamas and what just happened is because of how the criminality of the Israelis against the Palestinians for so long. And I, I thought to myself, how naive, how ignorant. It's like Jews that were all around the world while other Jews were being dragged to the gas chambers. They couldn't believe it. They didn't understand it. We didn't have social media then. And they don't understand that just because they're a Jew or a Christian, just because they're that, it doesn't matter if they're a peace activist. That spirit's going to kill them. It's going to rape them. It's going to steal their children. It's going to cut their children's heads off. It, it's going to parade their elderly around. It's going to do everything the scripture said they have done for years on years on end that their charter calls them to do. There was a, a, a lady who went and lived on the kibbutz, a Jewish peace activist. They took her. She hasn't been seen yet. Do you think it mattered that she was a Jewish peace activist? She was a Jew. So I say to myself, how stupid. How stupid. How stupid. How ignorant. That's why we need to have knowledge. And we need to understand what we're dealing with. You see, God made a promise and a covenant with Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant. Genesis 12, and then he repeated it through Isaac and Jacob, and the promise continued on with them and through David and to us through Jesus Christ. Those who bless her, his people, Israel, shall be blessed, and those who curse them will be cursed. I have no other way of explaining the destruction and devastation that's happening in Gaza right now than to say their charter says kill the Jews, destroy Israel. And their charter also says there's only one God, his name is Allah. They hate God. They hate the Jews. And when they're done with them, it's the heathen and the Christians too. You're in the Koran, you're called a pig. I don't recommend, if anybody here hasn't studied the Koran, you better be led of God to do it, because I had to do it. Don't do it. Because attached to it are some of the most demonic forces you've ever seen. And they'll begin to tug and pull at you and begin to give you half-truths. And that's why a lot of people that go to prison, they come out Muslims because it begins to give them a, another look and a think and a way. It's a very, 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 very demonic book. And I know I'm gonna risk some stuff here, but that is what it is. I must preach the truth. So having said that, let's just talk a moment about the covenant. I really wanted to get into it more, but we won't. I explained to you that there are two covenants. Is this on or do I have to do something? Oh, I have to hit this pen. Okay, put the pen on. That helps, doesn't it? Two covenants. New and what we call old, except the old had five, at least five. Some say eight. Different covenant thresholds. We know the new covenant. I'm not here to preach the new covenant today. I'm here to declare to you that God has given us a new covenant with Jesus Christ. And I'm also here to tell you he said himself he didn't come to destroy the covenants before him. He came to fulfill them, which means he's absorbing all of the consequences and promises 
of the covenants before him. Many times in our faith, what we're taught and we reel on is that, that grace is wonderful and because of it, the judgments of the previous covenants, are not, we're not subjective to them. But the truth of the matter is it also sustains the promises of those covenants. And most of those promises we find in the Law and the Prophets and some in the book of Revelation and some through Paul. But when we understand and accept that Christ came to fulfill the covenants, then what is covenant relationship with Jesus? What is covenant relationship with God? Dare we say that somebody who has not been able to discover and accept and walk into the grace of Jesus Christ has no relationship with God? Dare we say that? If they're declaring God, the God of Scripture, the God of Israel, dare we say that Jews have no relationship with God? There's a lot of scripture that lets us try to understand it. It's very complicated. But it's been used in, in promoting spiritual anti-Semitism in the name of Christianity. And many people don't even understand they're doing it. They don't even get it. And it causes some to go out and in some ways oppose the God of Israel not even knowing who they're opposing. And in this instance, I just want to pull out a couple scriptures. One of them I'd like to pull out is, first of all, to set the heart of Jesus if we could please, I want to read you what he said as he approached Jerusalem on his final time. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, yes, 70 years later, the temple was destroyed, A.D. But this look beyond it, and just so we know how it looked beyond it, he then goes and says and gives us an explanation of the season and the time that we understand to begin to understand that his second coming is, is at the threshold. And so this repeats itself. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. What is Jesus doing right now? I think the Lord is able to be all things at all times to all people, but I believe that at this point, Jesus is still weeping. I believe there's a part of his heart that is broken not just broken because of what's happening at this moment in time, because he's timeless, living both past, present, and future, so he can celebrate the millennium and at the same time grieve over this moment. But I think he's grieving mostly because for the best part of the world, it still doesn't understand the time of his visitation. And what we're called to do in that time of visitation. Hosea cried out, if we go to Hosea chapter 2, verse 1. Hosea was a very, very strange prophet. His name means salvation. Joshua, Jesus. And he came from the northern kingdom of Israel, which was Ephraim. And at that time, where he came from was enjoying prosperity. 
but inwardly it was all moral corruption and spiritual adultery. Does it sound familiar? And God had him live a different and a difficult domestic life. He actually had him live out this tragic dramatization of, of the unfaithfulness to God. God forbid he would have any one of us do that right now, huh? They'd lock us up, say we need psychiatric help. They'd call you deplorable, all kind of different names. Instead, he wants us to preach the word and to live it. He prophesied about a half, half of a century. And he had a threefold message that we need to hear today in the body of Christ needs. And one was that God doesn't like sin. We good with that? Sin separates anybody from God. And nobody is absolved of sin but through Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus. We got that down, hopefully. But his other one is that judgment is certain. God judges sin. And God judges the people in the nation that hate him. That was his message then. That's God's message now. And it's all the way to the last chapter of our book of Revelation. God judges people that hate him and the nations that hate God and that hate his people. And that God's love is unfailing. So, Hosea, who meant salvation, was required to divorce his wife and then to take upon himself a prostitute because God says, I'm divorcing Israel, but I will take her back as a prostitute. Can you imagine what people thought of Rabbi Hosea? in that moment huh could you imagine the persecution and can you imagine his children going to rabbinical school what they went through you're a bastard we know who your mama was where's your other mama can you think about it this is real stuff God made him live it out so that he would have the heart of God to understand how to preach it with passion to understand the pain to God of having to let go of the woman of your love in your life and to take on another one and learn how to love her, even though she comes from an idolatry and prostitute walk. And this is the scripture. Bring charges. This is chapter 2, verse 1. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife. Nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. And so the first thing he gives is a writ of divorcement because God cannot fellowship with sin and God will have no other God before him. And even though it's hard to preach, we have to understand that on Sim Ketorah, most holy day, that celebrates the word of God, on that morning was when this horrendous, tragic slaughter took place on what was called a supernova dance, celebrating in front of a Buddhist god of destruction. Is that a coincidence? I don't wish it upon those ignorant people. But as I said last week, the Lord said that part of our call and mission is to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. Where was the God of Elijah? He wasn't taught to the children. There was no fatherhood there. Yes, there were fathers grieving that their daughters and children were pulled away, but why were their children there? Now, yes, they were old enough to make their own decision, but were they brought up in the ways of God, even the God of Israel? Were they brought up in the rabbinical law and the Torah? I could tell you mostly not. Israel, 
other than the Orthodox and the Messianics, is not a religious society. It's a secular society. Very secular society. Tel Aviv is like a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah, maybe worse. It's terrible. And they brought that sin and they took it to a place right in front of century-old enemies of God and invited and lured them to the slaughter in front of a modern-day Dagon. Dagon was right in that same place. You see? And so we understand this is spiritual. And, and in this tense, now let's speed up with Hosea and go to verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will bring her into the wilderness. Where'd this happen? Now, I'm not saying this is the one. I'm telling you it's a foreshadow for us to understand what's going on. God brought the daughter of Zion into the wilderness. He's patient. And I will speak comfort to her, and I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor is a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of their youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of Baal, and she shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them. Verses 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. Righteousness. He was made sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. In loving kindness and mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Now you could say, yes, that's extended to Gentiles. Yeah, that's the way that Israel gets wiped out of all the promises. Don't be so bold and careful, because Paul tells us, I don't have time. Romans 11, don't be conceited. He said, God grafted us, you, everybody into a wild tree, but the root of that tree, the holiness of that tree is his bride, his love, Israel. Now, question. Right now, there appears to be a writ of divorcement. But let's go to, very quickly, to Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 7, this is about the deliverance of Judah I just spoke to you about. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. He wants to reunite Judah and Israel. But then he says this one. We love this scripture. We love this scripture. This one means a lot to us, doesn't it? We hear it so many times. Verse 10. And I will pour on the house, chapter 12. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Ho! Oh, the spirit of grace and supplication. Grace, it's not something we can do. I said last week, I can't repent for them. You can't repent for them. I can't repent for you. You can't repent for me. I can intercede. I can ask God to pour out grace, but it's got to be a relationship. But it's going to come from leaders. Ezekiel 34 made it clear, both leaders in the church and leaders in Israel. God is disgusted with the shepherds that feed themselves of the grace that God has given. That's why I tell you the church is sick. Because the pastors and leaders are eating all the goodness and leaving stubble for the rest of the sheep. And grace, then they will look upon me whom they pierce. Then they will look upon me whom they pierce. Not until he pours out the grace and the supplications will the blinds be lifted off that they could see and look. 
And the blinds have been coming off for a while since the beginning of the church, but they're still there. It's still foggy. It's still looking through a lens of culture and secularism and idolatry and rebellion and old covenant for some. And then they will look upon me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. He knows what it feels like to mourn as he mourned for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. We are to be cloaked with repentance. I have a couple robes early on that I made. As I understood, I had a ministry that was going to be walking in repentance and they're in sackcloth. And I realized that that was a manifestation, a physical manifestation of the spiritual mantle. So yes, sometimes I have a hard time Rejoicing when there's mourning. I can't help myself. I have a hard time experiencing wonderful messages that just tickle my ears and I just want to run right out and go buy a Maserati. I'm just seeing if you're awake. Bed bites, Maserati, okay. Because I look through the Lord's eyes and I see a sick bride. And I weep. I've cried so many times out, Lord, don't let your judgment start in the house of God because I fear what will happen. I had a vision once in Jerusalem of body bags being pulled out of churches. The Ananias and Sapphira thing, lying to the Holy Ghost. Blessings can become curses. Some of our most gifted leaders and generals, they're so blessed, but it curses them because they live by their gifts instead of by their hearts. Oh, but the grace of God. And then this scripture, my last one, Zechariah, chapter 13, 1. Thirteen one. In that day, go back to the day when he says he's pouring out the grace and the supplications. When we tie that in with Jeremiah 3 and with Joel, we understand that it's with repentance. If my people called by my name, you love that scripture? Shall what? Chronicles? If my people who are called by my name shall? Say aloud. Rob, I wish you and I could just go in a closet and pray for Israel and be the ones that God hears and turns the wicked ways, but son, it's got to happen there. It's got to happen there. That's my frustration. It's my harm. It's my hurt. When he gave me the scripture, I saw it in a vision. The next day, I walked from my house and some on the north side to the graveyard behind the Jewish center. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a man being brought to lay down before sundown that was part of my temple. I cried, Lord, Lord, have mercy. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. That night, that morning, in the wee hours of the morning, I had a vision, one of many, as I was locked up in that house by myself in Selma for one year. I saw a fountain open up. And that fountain got brighter and brighter. And I could literally smell the freshness of the water. And I knew right then 
and it was the most fresh, clean water I had ever seen or could ever see. And I watched it flow out, and I watched it hit the earth and begin to flow out. And then the Lord spoke that to me. He said, son, the day will come if you will, I will invite you to help prime the pump of that fountain. Let it be now, Lord. Let it be now. May that fountain open up in Jerusalem, Lord, now. The grace pouring out for sin, it takes grace, saved by grace. The blood washing the uncleanliness the washing of the blood. Let it be now. For thus comes the salvation and the redemption of my people, which was my prayer that brought me to him. So I stand at a threshold betwixt two emotions in my soul, one of joy that salvation is coming to Israel and the other one of deep remorse and repentance for the pain and the suffering both to Israel and the church. Let's end with this scripture. I think it'll have more meaning for you now than the many times I've quoted it to you verbatim. Romans 11, chapter 25. Paul gives a very deep and pointed discourse to the church about Israel and ultimately what's coming and that the promises are still alive. They've never died. They haven't been wiped out with a new covenant. They've been absorbed into this covenant. And he's speaking now to believers as he's going about in the Gentile world. He's not speaking to Jews. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, unless you should be wise in your own opinion. A better word is conceit, arrogance, mixed with complacency. That blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then all Israel will be saved. And as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Oh, I can't wait for that threshold. I'm not sure I'll be here for that one, but I think many of you shall be. I can't wait for that one. Do you see, beloved, why? I said a bold prayer multiple times publicly, large audiences on television. I said if there is such a thing as a pre-tribulation or a pre-tribulation rapture where God's going to take away all the believers and leave ignorant unbelieving people in my Jews to be punished without a Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's not my God. I said, Lord, if that's true, leave me. Leave me. Let me preach. Give me an opportunity, Lord. Leave me. How about you? How passionate are you? We're not all called to do the same thing. I don't expect you to walk in my shoes and I don't know how to walk in yours, but I know you have a path. I know you have footsteps to follow. Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah?
Oh, yes, beloved. Jesus is coming. I don't know exactly how. I certainly don't know when. But I can tell you this. If your only hope and goal is to somehow miss the calling of God to prepare the way or to love when love is hard or to be a light in the darkness, God help you. God help you. God help us. Patty, I know you're loving that baby, but I need you to come up here. You can bring the baby with you, but I think you ought to give that baby back to Grandpa over there. Proud one. I need you to grab a microphone, honey. When Patty's done, I want to take an offering. One's our tithe. And one's a special offering so that we can truly sow into some Jews in Israel at their darkest hour right now with relationship. Not just to feel good that we did something. Relationship. Relationship.